So my dear brothers and sisters, every day we, we live our lives and we make decisions according to our priorities. Okay, so there are certain things that we prioritize over others. Those priorities definitely change uh, depending on our age or our, our state of life. When we're young, um, our pri when we're at school, our priorities might be doing well in exams. Our priorities might be doing everything I must do to impress this girl or that fella and get happily married and have loads of kids and ride off into the sunset and all of that. That's, cause that's how it works in reality. Um, so we, our priorities may change. Our, our priorities might be to be able to run a certain distance, to be able to bench a certain amount, to look a certain way, to have a certain lifestyle or career, whatever it may be. You know, we've got certain priorities. And then other things must fall into second, third, fourth, fifth place because of those priorities, because you only have 24 hours in a day, you have to spend a certain amount of them sleeping, you have to spend a certain amount of them eating, one should wash occasionally as well, so like there are certain priorities, and other things will get pushed down the list. It's inevitable, it's just the way life is. Okay, so what St. Paul is saying in our reading today, it sounds a bit <clears throat> drastic, okay, He's speaking to the Corinthians. Brothers, our time is growing short, and those who have wives should live as if they had none, those who are those who mourn should live as though they had nothing to mourn about. Those who are enjoying life should live as though they had nothing to laugh about. Those whose life is buying things should live as though they had nothing of their own. And those who have to deal with the world should not become engrossed in it. <clears throat> this I say to you because the world as we know it is passing away. Right? It's, it's, it's a really blunt kind of a reading. And you might think, what on earth is he talking about? Like, those who have wives should live as if they have known. Those who mourn should... Like, you can't just... Well, you know, it just it sounds it sounds a bit ridiculous. Okay, so but if we see it through the lens of priorities, okay, you can imagine in your young years if you just spend all of your time almost obsessing about I have to get married, I have to get married, and because I have to get married, I have to look a certain way and I have to wear certain clothes, and I also have to be able to present myself in a certain way so that I'll get married. Otherwise, I'll end up alone. My goodness, and that becomes your your number one priority is everything is oriented around I have to have a relationship or be in a long term relationship, or I'm nothing. I just I haven't achieved anything if I haven't achieved this. Or then when I'm married, you can act, you, it can happen as well that one is more than dedicated to one's wife. It can actually be ob, you know, obsessed <laughs> and just completely ruled, dominated by the other person, by your partner. When for everyone and anyone, our first priority must be God. Our first priority must be our relationship with Jesus because everything else will pass away. Now, our <clears throat> earthly relationships, our family, the help of God, we'll get to heaven and we'll be more united with them in heaven than we've ever been here on earth because we'll have a perfect unity for all eternity, which won't have any kind of ups and downs. It'll just be a perfect unity for all eternity in God. So putting God in the first place here is in no way uh, disrespectful to our family. In no way does it mean I, I don't love you. It's just, I love God more. I love God first. And it, it's, it's rare to see this in, in a marriage. And it, even when, I, when I've heard different husbands or wives say it in the presence of the other half, um, it's, always, it's an interesting statement when you hear a wife say, you know what I mean? I love the Lord more than Jerry. And Jerry's sitting there, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and even for me, I think, what does what does Jerry think of this? Like, I mean, you kind of hope Jerry's in agreement. And then, yeah, Jerry. And then, then Jerry would, would look over and say, oh, "Yeah, ever since you know, ever since we've had our, our kind of rediscovery of the faith or our conversion, I mean, I've discovered a, a deeper love for the Lord now than I do for Mary." And I think, ouch! And yet, and yet, there's something just so right about it. There's something so kind of beautiful about being able to say with such confidence in the presence of your husband or wife. I love God more. That, that's actually the way it's supposed to be. It's actually the way it's supposed to be. That everyone's first priority is God because everything else passes away. Everything. So your career and the way you look and everything we've built up and our extensive wardrobes and all of these things that we invest time and money in and all, that, all of that, right? All of that, it's going to pass away. And St. Paul is, just like the way he says it, like the world as we know it is passing away. Brothers, our time is short. Now, 
we don't have to understand this as a, a, a kind of a, a global like catastrophe or an ending of the world. We don't have to kind of ap apocalypsize. Uh, that's not a word. We don't have to think of it in those kind of terms that everything is going to explode. And no, of course not. But at the end of the day, your time is short. You will have to leave. So it doesn't have to be an end of the world, but it's the end of the world as you know it, because you're gone. We have a limited amount of time. I'm 41, and I can't believe how fast time goes. And everyone, it seems, when they get to my vintage, seems to say, people I've spoken about, they seem to say, like, from once you hit, like, kind of your career age kind of thing, the time actually goes faster. Uh, because you're, you're busy, you're busy. There's constantly the next thing, there's the next contract, the next conversation, the next... You're, you're always kind of two steps behind where you're supposed to be trying to catch up. So life is just really busy and life just moves really quickly and you're just hoping that someday, some way I can squeeze an extra two hours out of today so I can just catch up. And things are just going so quickly. And then voila, you're 60. <laughs> it's incredible. Like, it's, just, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how fast things move. When I was in school, I used to think that like, time just used to drag, like second year to third year to fifth years. Leave and start like time use just so ridiculously slow. Whereas now it's just ripping past. It's 20 years since I entered seminary, 21 years since I entered, like <laughs> 21 years. Like time just moves so quickly. Our time is short. Our time is short. We must do the, the good we can while we can before we're gone. Briefly, if I may, on our first reading, Jonah. The book of Jonah is very short, it's four chapters. So we heard almost a full chapter today. You know the beginning of the story. Jonah gets called and he has to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was in the Assyrian Empire. So Jonah's in the, the northern kingdom of, of Israel. And he's called to go over to Nineveh to preach to them that their cities are going to be destroyed unless they change their ways. Okay? So he's, he's sent to preach in a non-Jewish city, in a, a non-Jewish land. Right, a foreign land, and go over and preach to them that their city is going to be destroyed unless they convert. So what would you do if you were like you're told, now you have to go over to um, Essex, right, and preach to them that they're going to be destroyed unless they convert? It's, yeah, come on now. In fairness. <laughs> they're, not, they're not going to listen to me. I'm, who am I? Like, I'm it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So Jonah, understandably, right? Assyria, that way. Tarshish, that way. He starts to head towards Tarshish. He says, no way, absolutely not. I'm not doing this prophet thing. Also, he would have known from the history of the Jews how, what actually happened with prophets. A, a prophet had a no-win situation. Okay? So you, you're sent to a city, and you have to preach the city's going to be destroyed. If the city's destroyed, why didn't you tell us sooner? Why didn't you tell us more convincingly? Right? You could have like you could have written to our politicians, and you could have convened uh, who knows what some sort of a gathering, and told them more convincingly that you, you you came too late. It's your fault. Our city is destroyed. Then, on the other hand, if you go to the city and preach, the city is going to be destroyed. And because they convert, the city isn't destroyed. People will look at you and say, "Well, how do we know this is going to happen? How do we know the city was going to be destroyed?" Like. How do you know it isn't all just made up and we've given up our drinking and socializing for nothing? You, you can't win. Prophets can't win. You can't win. You can't win. And this is exactly what Jonah knew. That's exactly why he's called to go to Assyria. And he heads to Tarshish. Um, he's on a, you know the story. He's, he's, he's on a boat and a storm uh, brews up and sailors, generally speaking, are very superstitious. So <clears throat> they were asking, who has done something to anger God to draw the storm upon us? Jonah lifts his hand, so they say, okay, well, God forgive us, but we have to throw you overboard. So they threw him overboard, storm calms. Uh, Jonah ends up in the belly of a whale and is spat out on land. Must have been somewhat unpleasant, but there you go. His life was saved, and uh, he says, okay, kind of re somewhat reluctantly then heads to Nineveh. Okay, preaches in Nineveh that the city is going to be destroyed unless they convert. That's our reading today. And the people actually convert somewhat miraculously. That's, I find that quite amazing. Uh, but they did. So he must have, I mean, the, the Lord was with him. The Lord moved their hearts. 
and he must have known the words to say to actually get the message across because changing your lifestyle because some bloke comes in and preaches your shit is going to be destroyed. Um, not an easy thing to do. So God saw their efforts to renounce their evil behavior and God relented. And he did not inflict on them the disaster which he had threatened. Much to Jonah's disappointment. Jonah waited outside the city, hoping the city would be destroyed. It wasn't. And he said, they're going to kill me. <laughs> and so he's, uh, it's, it's, just, it's, so, it's so kind of relatable what Jonah then says, you know. He's angry with God. He's angry that God didn't destroy the city. Right? You should have destroyed the city. You should have just got rid of it and then I'd have been proven right, you know, that... You should, they should have converted, they didn't, so now voila, there you go. Your fault. Okay? But they don't, they don't. Jonah was exceptionally displeased at this. He was indignant. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said would happen when I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, full of love, and that you relent from imposing terrible punishment. I beseech you now, O oh Lord, to take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. That's, that, that's a fairly honest prayer. Now, he's given out to God, which I wouldn't recommend you do. Uh, but he, he'd rather die. So he, he lies down outside. On, uh, he finds a bit of shade. God causes a, a, a castor oil bush to grow up, and it gives him shade. And he's delighted with this, because now he's not, you know, it's, it was quite warm. Uh, and then, very shortly afterwards, a worm comes and eats the roots of the castor oil plant, and it dies. And then, Jonah's annoyed again. Okay? And then, so this is, this is the, the whole book. This is the last bit of it here. God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the castor oil plant? Jonah answered, I have every right to be angry. <laughs> angry enough to die. Right? It's just, it's so, it's so human. Uh, again, I don't recommend this behavior, but like this is, this, this is in scripture. This is what it says. Okay? And the Lord said, you are concerned about a plant which cost you no labor and which you did not grow. Overnight it sprang up and overnight it perished. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish right from left. And they have many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned for such a great city? Are you angry at me because I love? Are you angry at me because I'm merciful? This is who I am. And sometimes, yes, we might prefer if God just came in and just smited everyone who, whoever offended us, but that's not what he does. Slow to anger, abounding in mercy. This is our God. And so in our own lives, there may be occasions where we prefer if God acted differently. We prefer if God maybe intervened. I was just talking to someone recently and they were saying like how uh, they've seen different situations where they just want God to come in and just pew, 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 right? just zap the people who are causing all the hassle and it will just be so much better for everyone. But it's not what God does. And so we rejoice in the Lord's mercy. At the beginning of every Mass, we celebrate the Lord's mercy asking for forgiveness for our sins that we might more worthily celebrate these sacred mysteries and the Lord grants it every time we go to confession we ask for forgiveness and the Lord grants it and we don't deserve it just like the people of Nineveh we don't deserve the Lord's mercy but he grants it because the Lord does not want the death of the sinner but the sinner might repent and have life life to the full So we thank the good Lord for his infinite mercy. <clears throat> we thank him for also sacred scripture on this uh, Sunday in which we remember uh, in a special way the, the word of God and the power of the word of God. Basically, the story of Jonah, we just, we just covered the whole book. It's four chapters. Uh, and we see the, the, the humanity of Jonah and the greatness of God. And so, Lord, we celebrate that. We celebrate your mercy. We celebrate your love. We celebrate your, pro your providence and how your gaze rests upon us how your gaze rests upon people who don't even know you and how you love them too and look out for them. Lord, may you bless each one of us that we may be your prophets, your missionaries, 
your consolation in this world so desperately in need of it.